name is, Fran my name is Francis Thackberry. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's talk, which is about uh, Chester Beatty and the, and the Chester Beatty Library, as I, as I still call it. Oh, you call it the Chester Beatty now, isn't that right? Um, I have to plead guilty, as some of you have been speaking to you uh, already, I have to plead guilty to knowing the cafe in the Chester Beatty much more than I know the full library and the museum. Because the cafe is great, I'm sure you, I'm sure some of you know that. But I'm hoping to be inspired to spend more time in the museum after I've had my lovely skulls there. Um, speaker tonight is uh, David Farley. He's a member of Kilmaine Inchicore Heritage Group and uh, he also works in the Chester Beatty. So, David Alfred Chester Beatty, mining magnet, collector, and philanthropist. Thank you. So, um, yeah, my name is David Barry, as uh, Francis was saying. Uh, I, work, I work in Chester Beatty. Uh, we're now calling it the Chester Beatty, but the previous name was the Chester, Chester Beatty Library here. Um, I'm a senior visitor service officer. So, I'm not a curator. Or I do have a big interest in the collection. I'm there 10 years ago, so I've picked up a few things. Um, so the talk is going to be like, I'm going to start off by just talking about Chester Beatty, what, what it is now, the cultural institution that it is today. And then uh, I'm going to look, look, look at Chester Beatty's life story. And then I'm just going to spend how much time I have and look at some of the collection that's there. There's the, actually that photo there is it's a bit dated now. We are called Chester Beatty, so that's an old uh, older photo. Um, it did win European Museum of the Year 2002. Um, so, yeah. the, the reason actually the reason we changed the name was uh, because uh, it's not really a library. If there is a reference library in it, but it's more of a museum. And, uh, we, we, it's a cultural institution, so it's all funded by the Irish state. So then we do these events that happen. There's um, we, we, uh, okay, sure. uh, what I'll do is I look sorry, just look at it. I'm gonna give you a little sure, little summary of Chester Beatty's life and the collection here. So so Chester Beatty, Sir, Sir Alfred Chester Beatty, right, was one he's one of the great collectors of the 20th century. Um, he was actually a mining he, was a, he studied mining engineering, so I'll look into that a bit more. Um, and he collected from all over the world. But there's, there's three main sections in the, in the, um, in the collection: you have Western, Islamic, and East Asian. So I'm going to look at some of those, some of those items. So what I'll do is I'm just going to start. Have, have many people been interested in it? Sure, they are all familiar with it and they've known a little bit about it. So, yeah. so it's in the grounds of Dublin Castle. We've actually been there since 2000. So it was originally in Shrewsbury Road at Bulls Bridge. So some people would be familiar with that. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go right back to the start of Chester Beatty's life story. Uh, that's in there. So Alfred Chester Beatty. He just went as Chester Beatty. And he was actually, he was actually Sir Alfred Chester Beatty as well. He was knighted later in his life. So he was born into a middle class family um, in 1875, the youngest of three sons. His father, John, was a banker, a stockbroker. Um, um, his mother was a hen. So, um, his, his, he had Irish ancestry. Go right back to um, his grandparents, paternal grandparents, our man each. So there wasn't a little bit of a link there. Um, and he, he got very interested in, in um, he, was, he had a big interest in mining and collecting. They were the two things that he, you know, he made his money in mining, but also then he, he uh, developed a huge collection, which, which he left in the Irish state. And there's actually an interesting little story when, when he was aged 10. Just, that's, that's in there actually. 
So when he, when he was a kid, actually, when he, um, he, he, was, he went to an auction in New York. He was born in New York. And he went to an auction house. And he ended up bidding on a, a piece of middle that a rock. And the other, the older men in the, in the auction was basically let him, let him have it. You know, he was very, 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 very small amount. So they thought it was hilarious. So again, that was just shows, that's a little, little story that shows uh, uh, where the guy just in the, the minerals that's mining, but also then the black as well. So it's, it connects the two things together. That's, that's in, in the early days of mining, that's, that's in there. Um, so he, he went, he, he went to um, Columbia University, the School of Mines. He graduated from the top of his class in 1898. And then he went to Colorado, Dallas, Denver, Colorado, one way ticket. So this is like still the Wild West at this stage. Uh, he, he didn't start off straight away as like a, even though he had qualifications, he still had to earn his way from the bottom of the hill. And he was, um, the people who take out all the, uh, the rock from the mines are called Walkers. Tough work. So, so that was like two dollars a day. So, there was a lot of people like that trying to make money. So this is um, today we're close again. Uh, he, so it was actually in Cripple Creek, Colorado, the gold mine, the largest gold mining between gold producing area in the world at that stage. Uh, it didn't take long to make a lot of money. He was making one thousand two hundred dollars a year, and when he got in with this guy called Rickard, T. A. Rickard, and then he ended up marrying his niece. That's Grace. Uh, that's his wife. There is uh, uh, Grace, and that's his son and daughter, Chester Junior and Annette. So he, he, he also ended up with, um, I, I won't spend too long on this quote, uh, the Google Mine Exploration Company, he made a lot more money then. That's where he really made a huge amount of money. And then he started, he, he had bought a house in New York and started collecting them. Now, his, uh, his wife, um, Grace, she was, called, she was also called Nanette. She, uh, unfortunately, she died in 1911 of typhoid cholera. And around the same time, Chester, he was diagnosed with uh, silicosis, which is a minor, a minor of disease. So now he still lived to a long, long age. This was, this did in fact impress the life. So around this time, just soon after uh, she died, uh, Nanette, he moved, he moved to London. This is where he was, he was for the next four years and where he collected most of the information. So that's because you grew up in the house there. It's a beautiful house. Yeah, it's beautiful. He was actually friends with Herbert Hoover. He made a friend with Herbert. He grew up in the world. So this guy, look, he had a lot of money in this stage. You know, he had a lot of money. He, 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 inherited, he also had a house in, um, in Cairo, in Egypt. And this is where he collected the Islamic collection. This is a very important part of the collection. This, this is where it all started. And, uh, so he married again. That's actually the impressionist painting. So he, he, I'll tell you that so He married again to, um, for the second time, to Edith. He did dull stone. So she was actually, um, she was a great big collector of her own book. She was very into the precious paintings. So that was, fortunately, don't have that anymore because he gave them away once after she died. He gave away the precious and most precious paintings. So, um, yeah, so, um, So just with the, in terms of his mining interests or how he kind of made money, 
he, um, his company was called Selection Trust. So, and they were mining in different places, um, including uh, in Africa, the northern Rhodesia, which is now Zambia, and the Belgian Congo as well. Now, you're probably thinking about the working conditions for some of the people. Um, he actually uh, helps people with uh, malaria, um, medical treatment for malaria, because they were out in the jungle in Congo and his, his conditions were very tough. So he did uh, he set up a program for that. Uh, and that was a copy for all of that. He seemed like a pretty good guy, like, you know, but obviously different times in terms of that. <laughs> Uh, that, that's him, uh, that's his son and daughter in Egypt, where he has, where they have a house. He actually overwintered the entire time. So, uh, in terms of using so. And he did that for his, uh, for health reasons. And also because he loved one.
also you know, can give multiple reasons. He saw the head of Exeter Ireland as well, Chester Jr. So this is, these are all reasons why the bench should be moved around. He actually has a, it's a quote there, because he was talking about the bureaucracy that under the new Labour government that it was it's harder to do business. He said, it'll be pleasanter to drink a glass of Irish beer in a Dublin garden than to spend the rest of my life buying ventilators and filling in forms. So he would have been he was 75 with Darwin. So it was a big, big change for him. For him. So his the, the new the, the new the new just that's it there actually. That was the or that was the Chester Media Library in Shootbrook. And he had a house in Aylesbury. He actually he brought over 9,000 books, so it was a big move. They weighed 35 tons, packed into 250 boxes, so it's a huge collection of this. We're going to look into that a little bit. Yeah, he was, and then he was knighted. He, uh, he, this was like 1950, was it 1954. He was knighted, so a little bit too late to give him a Britain at that point. So he was, uh, he died in 1952, so he lived much longer later than her. He also got the freedom of the city done as well, so he was, he was, he was well, um, well appreciated at this point of the time. That's him getting his honorary, becoming honorary Irish citizen. So Nima double error there. And it was a Johnny Costello, leader of the opposition and then president's Sean Tio. Sean Tio again, yeah, sorry. Sean Tio again, yeah. So honorary Irish citizen. So. <coughs> and he was a British citizen as well. Yeah, so it's an American citizen. British citizen. <coughs> Irish citizen. So like he, you know, there's um Pretty, pretty nice guy over, overall, you know, so. Like, he, he also, he quoted a quote from him, he said, like, I've been very, very fond of the country, this is Ireland, and I enjoyed my life here so much, and then I finally decided to build a library, and then I finally decided when I die, I wanted to leave to Ireland. So that's kind of his plan, but that's what he did. He actually, he liked kind of value for money in his collection, he didn't want to just spend loads of money on just say uh, a Shakespeare or maybe you know, some sort of original Shakespeare or a Gutenberg Bible. He, he liked to kind of look for something that was a bit of value. Uh, he died in 1968 in the uh, Princess Queen's Clinic in Wrighton Carl. That's where he died. And, uh, and he was awarded a state funeral. The first private citizen to be awarded a state funeral in Ireland. And very classic. So the, um, the, his will will provide for the continuance of the library as a public charitable trust supported by the state. The great legacy of Chester Media is his collection. And that's what we're going to look at. That's, that is the current home of, of the, the Chester Media. That's the clock tower building in Dublin Castle. So the building is around, um, it's going back to the 1700s, that building. <coughs> Designed by Francis Johnston, it was, it was well known. Um, so we, we moved the collection in there in 2000, so that's where I work. It's a nice, nice place. The, the, the newer part is stuck onto the old part where the exhibitions are. And you, you, nearby you've got the garden, the, Dub, uh, the Dublin Gardens, or so where Dublin gets its name from. So, okay. just a little bit So what I'll do is, um, I'm just going to, um, I'll just look, I'm going to look a little bit more of the collection, right? Is everybody okay?
way somewhere? Yeah? Yeah. I'm just going to give you a little bit of a sample and I'm not going to go into too much detail. <laughs> um, this is, I'm just going to look at the, there's three areas of the Western Islamic and East Asian. So this is, um, this is from the Western collection. These are uh, what's called a cuneiform tablet. These things are going back to about uh, two, right four, they're about 4,000 years old. They're going back to about 2,000 BC. And, uh, if you think of the expression set in stone, it's literally, literally a set in stone. Uh, some of these things are like for trade or contracts or you know, you know marriage, marriage contracts, that kind of thing. So we get a cuneiform, it's the shape, it's one of them, I think, a white shape. So it's going to be a little bit of a This is uh, Mesopotamia, the early civilizations. Right? Then you have uh, another example is ancient, this is ancient Egyptian. This is not, we don't have a lot of this in the collection, but I'm just going to give you a, uh, this is um, Egyptian Book of the Dead. And they would put this in to, to hopefully go to, uh, they want, obviously want to go to heaven instead of hell, so they, they try and put this into, your, uh, into the coffin to show that you're a good person, that <coughs> you be judged well. This is the biblical papyrus. Uh, we, we did have an exhibition of uh, the biblical papyrus from Roman Egypt that was on the week we got called First Fragments. I don't know if you really saw that. But we also have, there is, um, there's always some biblical papyrus on display at all times. Yeah, yeah, these are dating from, uh, these are dating from like, maybe three, three or four, uh, the third century AD. Yeah. So they're not, they're, yeah, they're not just from the exact time. I'm not sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. That they're, they're referenced. You can see where they, they would be, this is the codex where all the pages are put together. And you can see where they would be bound there. These the marks here. So they would be bound together. And this was actually a big deal when Chester Eaton collected this. When he when there was one particular collection of data from 19, uh, 1929. No, it was 1931. So this was kind of, this became news, big news when he collected uh, these items. Because it's some of the oldest some of the oldest uh, New Testament material uh, around. So we have, some, we have some examples over there as well. This is all in ancient Greek as well. Um, he actually he needed when he found out about it, he needed to uh, he needed, he sent the information, he sent a coded message telegram to an academic in the British Museum. And he did want it to be intercepted, so he actually sent a message there to uh, Eric Miller at the British Museum, where he said, Silver mine, very rich, has three shafts. Uh, then he said, Gold mine, rich, has four shafts. Should buy both without fail, especially silver mine. So Eric, Eric Miller knew the code, uh, and he was able to then, they were able to communicate together, and Eric, he, Eric Miller was able to give the advice. Well, he was, uh, Chester Beach, he was in Egypt, and he was sending the information back to Eric Miller and the British Museum. And they were able to. Uh, and you had? Yeah. I'll just move over here. Uh, this is another example here. This is, uh, this is Durer, the four hours. This is another example from the Western collection. This is Durer, uh, four horsemen of the apocalypse. He was an artist um, of the Northern Renaissance. And that's actually his initials there, Albert Durer. Yeah, they're wood cuts. So they would be, yeah, they would be from 
mass produce the. Uh, so we well, the one we have we have a, we don't have the first edition we have when it was we issued later on in fifteen eleven. So they're, I think they're really nice. So actually, all the Dura pieces have the initial. Do you, can you say whether or not Durer actually did the wood cut himself? Yeah, I was just. Well, apparently there was people copying. There was people copying Durer, and um, we, we one of them is we have one in the collection that uh, was cut was a uh, fake, but meeting the use of it. But uh, it's but it's from the same period, mm. and. Uh, and then Durer got so sick of people uh, copying his prints that he, uh, he, he took away his initials so as a way of you knowing you know, where that was. Because after a certain point, the initial, the AD was no longer there. So, so this is part of it. There's multiple prints in the collection. We also have uh, Goya, Spanish artist. So, you can see the variety in the that we have here, you know, it's amazing. I wouldn't be an expert on every line here, but I'm just giving you a little sample. Um, this is the uh, Coat to be Book of Arrows. This is another one I think to be nice. Um, these, this is French, this is a French item. Uh, they have like, lovely borders here as well. Some of the scenes in it are quite violent. The Book of Hours were these um, private prayer books that you know, this, this one was made to order. It's a beautiful piece, like, it's a beautiful book. And uh, by a rich, a rich wealthy, uh, at the Admiral, Admiral France actually. But um, Cody, it was made for him. This would go back, this is uh, the 15th century. And they have these inhabited letters here. Let's call it an inhabited letter. And actually, there's, there's scenes that jump, that there are funny scenes that are like this, and they go into the next page. So they have these like little animal scenes, and they'll go from page to page, and you see the borders. Um, and this. Yeah, there's just I, they'll have Christian martyrs as in this as well, like Saint Steve and certain other videos that are very really violent scenes like, like that one there. That's the martyrdom of Saint Luke. And you can see they're bringing him to heaven at the top of the at the top there. And that's actually Saint Luke featured at the bottom as well, sitting just um, creating the gospel there. That's an Ethiopian gospel book. And in this story, there's an artist and he's up on a scaffold and he's doing artwork. And the devil knocks him off the scaffold. And he's rescued by Virgin Mary there. So he's, he's, he's doing religion and he's painting religious pictures up on the scaffold. Where does that come from? That is from the 19th century. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'll just keep going, sure. Um, that's the, this works for the Islamic collection now. That's the um, the Ruiz Bahan Quran. That's, um, that's called uh, Shamsa. So we do, we've got a lot of grounds in the collection. And this is the one, one of the more beautiful ones. So he would have picked up a lot, uh, just picked up a lot of items uh, in Cairo, from dealers in Cairo. So, Ruiz um, Bahan, it's called Ruiz Bahan Brown, but that's the, the name of the, uh, the calligrapher we designed. But there's other calligraphers, there's other uh, assistants. <coughs> And what material would that have been? Yeah, it's 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 paper. Um, it's on paper, but they use a lot of uh, 
pigments for colors actually. So how would that look? So they used yeah they used like lapis lazuli and they used gold. So the blue and the gold go really well together. So the, when they we we did all the exhibition of this, it was called lapis and gold. And lapis lazuli is quite different. So great that great one of the one of the items that creates the blue color. And they use all these different chemical reactions to uh, to create. It's amazing what they do to create the all different colors. But how durable are the materials to use, like the paint? Or they're, 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 what well, they do is they do burnishing. Uh, they, they, once they put all, once they paint, paint it on, they use a stone to make sure that the colors uh, all stay together. So they're incredibly well designed. They, they really are amazing. I mean, they actually use uh, kitten hair for the for the bushes, and they would breed their own kittens uh, for the for the purpose. They like two more little kittens actually so, uh, from the neck. Okay. No kittens from arms. <laughs> the uh, design is right. So this one is really nice. I think I like this one here because it's a bit of a bit of a story with it. This is from the uh, the Chardonnay. This is a Persian epic, and the, the story here is this: the you'll see the baby there. That's Zal. He's a, an albino child, and um, he's the, the king's son. And when he's born, the king uh, they, they think it's a bad prophecy to the albino child, so they abandon him to the mountain. And uh, but he's rescued by the sea bird, which is that phoenix bird there. And uh, the seabird brings him back and raises him. Uh, the seabird mother <laughs> basically with his mother. Um, years later, then, he, he's reunited with his father. That is a, a caravan of a traders spotted when he's grown up. But, and so the seabird has to leave him. And it's kind of an emotional goodbye. But with the seabird, before he goes, the seabird says, you know, if you're in trouble, take some of my feathers and burn them, and I'll come to your rescue. And later on, then, when he's grown up and his wife goes into labor and she's in trouble, he burns the feathers, and the seabird comes and organizes a cesarean section. <laughs> <laughs>
This one here is printed items. Anyone? So what happened was there was a million of these made by the Empress uh, Shotoku in Japan, and 100,000 were sent to each um, for 10 tenants. It's, it's a little million of them made. And the, the little inscription there, it's Buddhist, and it's, it was actually put inside the thing. It's actually put inside the thing. So we have it in there. <laughs> it, it is a Buddhist, it's a Buddhist inscription. That's the uh, great encyclopedia of the uh, young, the young men. And uh, this is this is Chinese. Right? And uh, this is going this is going back to the 1500s. We it was actually it was reissued again. It was a second edition of a maid. It just shows that how um, interesting the the BR, the um, organized Chinese were, that they collectively they got experts from all over the world to commission to um, get all the information known around the world and to collect to create all these different encyclopedias. So <coughs> we have three of these in our collection, and each one is on a different topic. So like we have this one's on the, we have one on bamboo, uh, it's just a whole book about bamboo. Another one's about Paper. And there's another one I can't remember the other one is. Yeah, they're pretty fascinating pieces. So there's not many of them survive. There would have been 11,000 volumes originally, but um, there's not many survive, also in China. They're still bottles. And they're made of different minerals. So, just to be being very into it, so it's minerals. Um, this might be thought. He likes the digital stuff like this. It's not like powdered tobacco. And there is 900, I believe, in the, in the collection. And there was more, but he used to give them away to different people just as he is. This is. These are Japanese woodblock prints. So we have several, this is, uh, that's Hokusai, uh, Main Fuji, he a series of, uh, series of different images about uh, Main Fuji. And it, the Hokusai, yeah, he's definitely one of the, the most famous of the Japanese uh, lot designers. He lived to, he lived to a very old age, but he always thought he never, he never quite perfected his, his skills, which is interesting, you know, even though he was so good. And these are, this is from, this is what we call Yuki, Yuki OA, is it? That's the name of the Japanese book of it. It's a really, really interesting period in the Edo period. So. So, another one there, so, with Fuji in the background. So, that is Chester Beatty, just that's actually what we're going I'm just kind of coming to an end now. I'm just going to, uh, just have another few photos, but I'm just going to kind of wrap up here. Um, that's just maybe 1934. So that's good to see him in his prime there. That's him in France. And that's, that's us there now. The Gift of a Lifetime is the exhibition to, uh, to honor the 50th anniversary since Chester Beatty died. So that would be 2018, and I have the catalog with me, so I can I'll pass it around in a minute. And then we have different items, different uh, images from the collection there. That's the Dublin Gardens. The design is like uh, this kind of the design of the gardens is kind of water or the pool where the Vikings came in. <laughs> so there would have been a small pool there. Oh right, but this the location we were yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, I know it's hard to kind of match it now, but uh, the shelter car would look like it. That's the Arts of the Book exhibition. That's the samurai costume there. So they do change things out. But that would be, what's that? Hard to my job, I just open the case as well. The people put the stuff in, but every winter they do change some of the items in the collection. 
So you get to see something different when you come back. That was also around the time of 50, the, the anniversary of Chester, 50th anniversary of Chester who died. They issued these stamps. There's four stamps, one for Chester himself, and then the three, one for each of the three areas of Western, the Islamic and East Asia. That's a collection. Oh, that's it, actually, yeah. So, um, hope you enjoy that. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit brief. <laughs> You mentioned that they, each year they change some of the items in yeah. the display. What percentage of all these items are on display? What percentage is the storage? Like how big yeah, is it? Yeah, it's, like it's only one or two percent is on display. That's all. Yeah, that's all there is, yeah. So there's, there's a huge amount more. I can't tell you the location, but it is a lot more stored away. Is there any. Uh, Account of how extensive the collection is in terms of items. How many items? Has anybody ever said how many items are included? Sure. I mean, you mentioned the number of books. I didn't say something like that. I did nine thousand books. Uh, like a little bit of there. Nine thousand yeah. yeah. yeah, books. Nine thousand items. But, uh, so we'll probably off that. Yeah. So we moved to Ireland. Is the collection was pretty well assembled at that point. Because he made so much money in the 1920s and 30s that. And you actually mentioned the the number of crates. So yeah. 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 But, yeah. But basically, just on on the space, what two percent? Then two percent. Yeah. Right. So. Do you want to look? I can. You can look. You've got some questions. If you want to, just want to pass around. Uh, well, um, look in there. You want to? Uh, like, oh, there's, there's some catalogues there. If you want to, just you might inspire you to ask more questions if you want. To. Um, do you know how many people come to research there from the sort of countries that are represented? In other words, is the, I know. Is the collection sort of very significant in relation to any of these countries? Yeah, I didn't really touch on that. There is, we do have a reference library, so where scholars can uh, book in and they can, they can actually get access to the collection there. So it's going to be brought out for them. And study particular items. But it's all kind of booked in advance. Yeah. And when you do an exhibition, do you show you know, a special item from the uh, collection or do you really have like on the same collection of uh, <coughs> oh, from somewhere else? Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have a temporary exhibit space. And usually it's it's some item from it. it's usually some focus on the collection itself. Okay. And uh, but, uh, on occasion it could be it could be something on loan. We did have a uh, Hong Ling Chinese artist mm -hmm. from uh, six, seven years ago. But these massive big paintings are like they were a bit obscure looking, some of them were like you're looking at trees, but you don't know what angle you're looking at. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and sometimes it's a mixture actually. For the last exhibition we did a few items from the National Museum. Mm -hmm. That was for our first fragments. Hey, yeah. Where do we get a lot? Where do we source all of this material? Like, I mean, uh, private dealers, auctions. Did you have pe did you have people searching for stuff? Yeah, a um, bit of a bit of a mixture. Yeah, I have. I don't know if to quick with people. For instance, there was a guy called Jack Hillier who was uh, he was an actually East Asian expert. He was a Japanese woodblock expert. And Chesterfield trusted him so much that he, uh, he commissioned, he just said, look, go off and find really good examples of uh, Japanese woodblock prints, particularly ceremonial prints. The ceremonial are, they have the, they have the writing on them. You know, you might see some examples in the book. So we have five or six hundred examples of them in the collection. And they were considered a bit, they were cheaper than the other ones. Because people, some people didn't like the, they're writing on it. <laughs> you know, so. And what did the guy think? He possibly have looked at all of these. It was just too many writers. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So was he just like an anti just buying stuff to say? He couldn't possibly have looked at all of these things in time. I think what he was, he, he, he did it very well. But he, he had experts who would help him out and they would look at it, right? And then he'd get it. But then he tends to make the last decision himself. Most of the time he would actually make his final decision himself. But based 
some expert advice. Yeah, no, sorry, what I meant was yeah. when he actually bought it, so, yeah. what was the purpose behind it? Because it's not like he could read the 9,000 books or no. polish yeah. all the 72,000 yeah. yeah. boxes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, he didn't probably, even with his four houses, he probably didn't have room yeah. to put them all out on display. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just curious yeah. what drives such a, like, I mean, I know people collect yeah. art or symbols or yeah, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But on such a scale, well, it's you can possibly have actually enjoyed all of the things in mass. Well, I suppose he's collecting over a long period. He is collecting over a long period. Yeah. And his wife, uh, Edith, would buy him a present, but she'd buy him something for his birthday. So, she's so clearly, I think the Coat to the Hours that I mentioned in the book of Hours of France, that would have been bought from, from Edith yes. for him. Yeah. So. He didn't like modern art, you know, he wasn't into, you know, so you might say he's, a, he's very religious, but they got all the best manuscripts are from so many of them are religious anyway. Yeah, was he even a dad as well, or did he, so it's like No, he didn't actually. Okay, interesting. No, there was no endowment, he just, he just left to the Irish table, but there was no, there was no money meant to fund it. So how about the the original museum that was on, say, um, Tuesday Road? Yeah, that, that was like it was custom built, right? It was custom built, yeah. So was that built by the government to house it, or did he actually build that for the thing? Yeah, I'm not sure actually. Yeah, I presume his money would go into it, but I don't know actually. But it's, it, so the collection is fully owned by the state. There isn't a an in between like trust. Or yeah, there is a trust. There is a trust. I mean, the collection was left to a, a trust. Now it's like there still is a trust, so there is a board of trustees. But maybe it's not quite as maybe vital as it would be before because it's a whole team now. But the trust is still involved. Um, I don't have much to do with the trustees myself, or it's it tends to be the management. But uh, yeah, they're still, they still have a important role. Catherine Day is the, is the former. She's the current head of the board of trustees. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, it's, it's free to come in and yeah, say what. Well, unlike say the National Gallery, we should be charged into temporary exhibits. Uh, everything's free here, so yeah. Um, Especially since it, this space is not huge, and the, yeah. the temperature of the space is not that, it's not that big. I just, just <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Do you know, David, did he ever write anything in terms of a philosophy or. Just to be? Yeah, about his motivations or anything like that as to why he was doing that. Why he was doing it. Yeah, yeah, well, somebody might have, must have asked him at some stage, yeah. why are you doing this? <laughs> <that?" laughs> and, and, yeah, <laughs> and he would have replied, like, <laughs> yeah. to an yeah. interview on the next yeah. Sunday Times or something. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I'm quite surprised that they would make this collection. It's far finer than yeah. I am exceptional. Almost like Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Things were good, you know, he collected a lot at that stage, so other people were probably struggling financially, but he was doing well, he was doing very well, so. When you think about what the Taliban did to the statues of Bamiya, mm. you know, it's kind of the opposite of that, yeah. you know, yeah. they, they, yeah. they destroyed something that was mm. ancient and yeah. he was preserving something that was Yes, ancient. and I think people from... People are very happy about how their cultures are represented in the Jesuit. Nobody ever complains about a bias or. We're turning. Hmm? There's no question of returning. I We're turning, yeah. yeah. I was. Somebody did. I was talking to somebody today at work about it, and they. I don't. I can get the full story. I don't know if I've died from a surgeon, but somebody said that there was somebody in the Middle East who was. who did make an offer, a huge money offer, I can't remember the price, 
to buy in Quran. So I'm assuming it's the Ibn al Arab Quran, which is, you'll see it in the books, it's gone around. It's, it's, uh, it's from 1000 AD, um, and it was, the calligrapher was Ibn al Arab. So and he's really famous at that time, and they know it's him, and they know exact date. And this, this is a very valuable item, possibly one of the most valuable. But when you think about the Elgin marbles and the row that's yeah. constantly going on about mm. who owns them and who should have yeah. them, so is the owner, was the ownership of all these items always understood to be his and uh, mm. their future <coughs> being his? Yes. Uh, they don't know, they don't have a full record of every single piece in the collection and how it was purchased. It sounds like it looks like they know the majority of it, but there are some gaps. There are some gaps. Well, he wasn't a pillager, though. No, he wasn't a pillager. Yeah, yeah. 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 They were not stolen. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. No, they weren't stolen. They were, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of examples. Yeah, no, they, they, there are records of how much he made for certain things. And, uh, he bought, he would buy from another, say, uh, another dealer or another collector. He just buy somebody would have collected those books and he might have just bought some of them. So, so it's a combination of different things. Wasn't that record how his children felt and he was giving away his stuff? I don't know, I think about his daughter actually, she barely gets a mention of anything I read to dig a bit deeper. Like his son, his son inherited the business selection trust after he retired and his son then had a house in, in Ireland. And his daughter actually died before he did as well. Oh. So I don't know what when she died. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, David. For thank you. That really did uh, uh, get us get us interested in going upstairs, yeah. going in, and going yeah. upstairs. Yeah. And, yeah, so thank you. comments. Um, we hope you'll come back to, uh, we're planning a few talks now on the last Wednesday of the next three months. Uh, next month uh, we have Cui uh, Bing standing at the back there, uh, 27th of March, we'll be talking about uh, uh, the foundation of Golden Bridge Cemetery right beside us here. Uh, we'll, uh, Michael will be talking to us in April and we'll have a talk at the end of, uh, at the end of May as well. Um, if you're not on our mailing list, and I think most of you probably are, if you don't, if you don't get emails from us, uh, there's a sheet just there at the back. Uh, give me your name and email address and I'll put you on that so you'll, you'll uh, have some information. So three talks coming up at the end of the next three months. And then in the summer we hope to have some uh, walks and, and, uh, and or visits or uh, organise a few other things. Just to mention, the Heritage Group, there's only, there's only six of us actively go on a, a committee and plan things and, and, and uh, discuss things. We meet uh, once a month on the third Monday of the month in the Glen of Aherlow. Uh, we'd love to have more people to contribute and, and talk about what we should be doing and what we could be doing and to contribute. Some of you, I'm sure, uh, have a lot of knowledge about things locally and might be willing to, to uh, give us a talk uh, like we had tonight. So please think about um, joining the committee of the Heritage Group and, and uh, contributing a little bit towards it. Uh, if you're interested in that, please uh, uh, drop me an email and we'll, we'll confirm the times of meetings and so on. And uh, yes, our email address is Kilmainham, in, Kilmainham Heritage at gmail.com. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.